the way forward, strengthening the working class and people's movement. But like I mentioned before yesterday, before every session, we want to make sure that we include a cultural presentation. And today, can we give it up for um, Laura Cambron? appreciated a lot of what's been said um, since yesterday and even on Friday. Um, and I think uh, I've been a little lazy too long. And so I think, you know, it was really important for me to be here because even though my parents have been in the party since I was a kid, um, I feel like I have to respond now to the times. Uh, you know. So. <laughs> But um, so also, uh, uh, I think it, maybe it's also manifested uh, in other ways. Um, this music that I'm going to share with you guys is, is called Son Jarocho, and it's from Veracruz, Mexico. Um, but it's existed for over 300 years. It came in with, uh, with the Spaniards when they came, and, and they brought the slaves with them. And also, it, it mixed with indigenous, the indigenous communities there, and as well with the African and the Spanish. So there's elements of that existing in this music today, and it survived, I think, in large part because of the way that it's played. Um, it's played in, with very, various musicians. You gather around a wooden box where the percussion also plays out. Um, but the whole idea is from beginning to end, which from the beginning means you start preparing the food, right? Um, you gather people. You have the cases to come and play the music. And so really what it does is it creates community. And it preserves it. And so this music has survived, I think, in large part because of that. And now on this side of the border, we've taken that on kind of like as, a, as, as our objective. You know, how do we combat kind of the social ills of capitalism? Whether we're conscious of it or not, but we're drawn to it because it reconnects us with people. It reconnects us with this idea that um, you can exist, that coexist in a beautiful way through music. So, um, but this music also has taken on kind of the, the shape of uh, the times that we're in and have been in. Uh, we, at least here in Chicago, I'm from California. Uh, we, you know, with, the, with a lot of stuff that's happening here in Chicago, obviously with the mayor and the, the schools, the CPS, and how badly, you know, the, the obstacles, the real challenges that they're facing. Um, one of the projects that we took on was really trying to support the CTU, the Chicago Teachers Union. And so last year when uh, they had the one-day strike, we went around and we visited a bunch of the schools and just played for the teachers. You know, they were out there 6 in the morning and we were there, you know, chanting and playing for them because, you know, it was, it was, um, you know, because we need it. It's energy, right? And it energizes us. So. Uh, but this song that I'm going to play, um, it's called Los Pollos. And, you know, people, just to survive, people have had to be subversive in any community, right? And uh, this, music, this song, in particular, people think that it came from this idea of communicating without letting the, the owners know what was going on. So Los Pollos, kind of in the verses, they talk about, you know, hey, watch out, here comes the the jefe, or here comes, you know, you got to be careful. Um, and so, but they would use it in the form of chickens. So they would talk about chickens, but they were talking about other stuff. That's the theory. Oh, 
true of us women. I noticed that women, I'll speak at the end of the speakers list, but also of, you know, other people who aren't, you know, used to, anyway, we have to, you know, feel comfortable and free to do it and know that we're all nervous, but, you know, our voices are important, so I just wanted to share that. Okay. Now um, today we're talking about the way forward. I, how come I get the tough question? Um, <laughs> but we had a, an amazing day yesterday, and I think we have a lot to build on. Um, we want to chart a path for ourselves, for the party, but also for our movement, and those two things are not separate challenges. Um, communists have a history of deploying limited resources. At the founding of our party in those days, we were uh, just a politically isolated, mostly immigrants, Finnish, Lithuanian, Jewish were the major... Uh, groupings, and they were in little nationality associations, and there was a small base of native-born uh, radical unionists, only a handful of African Americans, and mostly um, because of their new status, people were not engaged in the civic life of the country. Um, the labor movement that they had to engage with was very small, weak, divided, and under right-wing leadership. However, um, and they had to leverage whatever they had to fulfill their mission, which was to move the whole working class. You know, pretty challenging. Um, because that's what the Communist Manifesto declares, that we are fighting for the whole working class. We're responsible for it. Um, and with the guidance and experience of the world working class movement, they tried to come up with a strategy to take these limited resources and do something big. Um, at that time, there was a new and emerging industrial working class. It was young and vibrant. It was on its way to becoming uh, multiracial as the country changed from small workshops and agriculture, um, more the working class, oh, and as the great migration of African Americans from the South. Um, so even in, when the working class still only made up about 50% of the population, but, and most of those workers were um, industrial. But the party methodically chose just four key industries, steel, auto, transport, and electrical. And they only made up a small piece of the working class, but we believed that because of certain characteristics of those sectors, those workers could be you know, like a lever to move the whole class. And some of the characteristics uh, and, and change the balance of forces in the nation. So some of the characteristics of these four sectors um, that caused them to be chosen was that they were the heart of manufacturing. They had the power to stop um, uh, production. 
they could stop the economy. Um, the conditions of work were very cooperative. You had thousands or tens of thousands of workers in one place, um, often multiracial workforces. They lived in concentrated and working class neighborhoods. Um, they were, this was the place where workers encountered the monopolies directly, where their, their um, surplus value was stolen from them. These are the wealth producing um, sectors. Um, so the party and the uh, movements close to us focused their attention and resources on those areas, on those workers, on their factories, on their neighborhoods, and their uh, communities. So, for example, the Daily Worker focused on reporting on those issues. Worker, the worker was distributed at those plants and at other organizations those people belong to, not by the people who work there, but comrades from all over participated in this effort. And most important, uh, I think, we brought those workers not just into the party, but into the party leadership. Um, and we built the party and its influence in those areas as a way of moving the whole class. And alongside of that, we identified, um, alongside of identifying the strategic sector of the working class, we were able to identify key issues for the class. Um, and we've talked about these, the role of racism, both in dividing the class and in retarding democracy. We brought in the idea that racism was not something that would be automatically addressed somewhere down the road, but that we had to specifically address it now. Um, and it wasn't a distraction from the class struggle. The idea that the fight against a war, that a fight against your own country's imperialism was important. Um, we brought in the idea that mass unionization was critical for power for the working class and that the way to do it was along industrial lines, not craft by craft. Um, we said that you couldn't shun the right wing unions and you couldn't stop and go out and try to create perfect ones, but you had to work in the existing unions as difficult as it was. And we, under William C. Foster, developed the idea of rank and file caucuses as a tactic to do that. And the party brought in the, idea, the outrageous idea that people could be paid for not working. You could be paid for unemployment comp. You could be paid for Social Security. Um, this was unthinkable that you could win that, uh, but the party said that you could. And um, so in a situation in the Depression when the working class was starving and homeless, they could have fought each other. But the principles of, that the party, the communists put forward and helped win people to, you know, created a different situation where great gains were won. And some of the um, issues were uh, like advancing democracy, expanding voting, again, doing away with the poll tax, fighting lynching, fighting for civil rights. And there's so many things that we fought for that are, were won, at least in the thinking of our people, that Sometimes we lose our niche, like everybody takes your idea and then who are you, you know? <laughs> but I guess that's a good thing. Um, like industrial unions and the need for racial unity as an issue for white workers. Um, and that unity was an issue for the whole class. I see, I'm see. i so delighted to see these old pictures of CIO white workers in Detroit marching with signs, free the Scottsboro boys, you know, and like, I'm thinking, how in the heck did, you know, why, how did they see that connection that was so, so deep? Um, uh, and we brought the idea of the role of the labor movement as speaking for the whole working class, not just for the people they represent, and the idea of international solidarity as opposed to align with your own country's uh, ruling class. Um, there's so many Marxist ideas of how about the economy that are now generally accepted, that labor creates all wealth, those kind of things. Um, they're now part of the accepted wisdom, certainly on the left, but also uh, widely among broad masses. Um, so let's get to the, so they were able to change the balance of power. That was a good strategy, I think. Not that I'm proposing that strategy for now, but I wanted to show how we came to that. So let's get to the present. Um, in our own lifetimes, even the youngest person here uh, has seen this, our working class has experienced a change at least as dramatic as the industrial revolution that led the basis for, um, uh, for industrial unions. <coughs> the nature of production has been revolution, excuse me, revolutionized by automation, by communication science and technology, and quiet as it's kept, 
the working class has quietly and steadily become the vast majority of the population of the United States. 90% of our country are wage earners. That's how Denise, just, you know, the pocket definition of the working of workers. There is a small business class, what you often hear called petty bourgeoisie, but I like to use words that I feel other people will understand, so I'll call them the small business class. And they, you know, they shrunk from what was almost 50%, you know, not so long ago, down to uh, less than 10% of the population. There's 30 million small business owners. Um, the people who were professionals and technicians, doctors, architects, engineers, right, um, have now become wage earners. Um, the number of farmers has shrunk as we, we have corporate farms, and only 2% of our workforce is in agriculture, and those are also mostly uh, wage earners, although they don't earn much of a wage. Uh, um, but they all have the common experience, every worker, whatever income or category, they don't have control over the conditions of their existence. They have insecurity, no matter what. But ironically, anyway, the, the vision I think people have nowadays is that the working class is shrinking. That's how people think of it. Um, that's on us. And even in the party, sometimes we talk that way. Um, uh, I think we move backward on keeping up with the new working class to a shocking place where the working class in popular conversation is pictured as old white men. I like old white men. I, I'm married to one. <laughs> At least old working class men. But I think they look a lot better in their natural setting. Don't get me wrong here. Which is <laughs> as, as part of a multiracial, multigender, young and old working class. So we have a big job to do to de redefine in the eyes of the working class itself, in the eyes of the left and even in the party, what the working class is. Um, in connection with that, I think we've lost track of a discussion we started before our last convention. There was a pamphlet called Big Picture Trade Unionism, um, and I wanted to go back to that because I don't think we completed that discussion, uh, talking about the changes in labor. So. Um, and you know it's a problem, we say labor, we don't know if we mean the working class or unions, so I'm going to try to be careful about that. Um, the working class still uh, creates all value, but the capitalist class has been successful in defining out so many of our fellow workers. They've defined out 10 million undocumented workers as not being part of our class. They've defined out a prison population Alex, do you know how many, what our prison population is? Uh, over 2 million. 2 .2 million who are working in factories and call centers as not part of our working class. Um, they defined out tens of millions of African Americans, Latinos, women who don't fit the, you know, the stereotype. Um, young people in new tech jobs have, you know, they're not defined as part of the working class. Anyway. Um, but it really, but um, we have to figure out who the working class really is and what do they do. How is America create? How is value created in America today, and who does it? Industrial industrial workers still create enormous value. You know, I don't want to lose that. But a quarter of them create more value today than four times as many did 20 years ago. And I, if you walk through a steel mill today that used to be bustling with people, there's it's like a ghost town, um, but more production is coming out than ever. Um, and so maybe you have a, a robot replaces four assembly line workers, and a tech worker maintains and programs dozens of those. In effect, that one tech worker is taking the place of uh, producing what scores of workers had. His work is a, or her work is of enormous value. Then we have new industries with new products that have emerged as low-wage industries. Um, we should never call them crap jobs because that denigrates what the people do. You know, they're doing things of value. I'm guilty of that. Um, call centers. 2% Two uh, of the American workforce works in call centers. Healthcare workers, like 15%, people in taking care of nursing, the whole healthcare industry. Retail. Um, and um, for many of these, 
the, the, the value that's created isn't a, a product but a service, but it's still the product of human labor. Then we have runaway industries, and I'm not talking about industries that go to other countries, but that have run away from decent jobs right here in the U.S. Benny's not here. Huh? Truck drivers who were union and so on. Um, manufacturing jobs that have moved. Um, construction jobs that are done by low-wage workers. In my industry I work with, um, landline phone workers, highly paid. When cell phones came in, the cell phone technology done by low-wage workers. Um, unionized meat cutters, great jobs, replaced by poorly paid fast food workers. Unions aren't able to follow the changes in pr methods of production as nimbly as capital can jump from here to there. And this is one of the things that's happened. We have uh, so many unemployed people, partially employed people, day laborers, on again, off again workers. But the bottom line is, as the vast majority, the working class occupies a different, potentially more powerful, more powerful position in our society than even before because we're such a big majority. Um, so we hear a lot about how the portion of the workforce that's in unions has drastically declined, and this is often taken to mean that the size of the working class has declined. This has to be corrected. The labor movement is a critical part of the working class, but it is not the same as the working class. <clears throat> so now on to some ideas about moving forward. <coughs> Excuse me. Am I talking too fast? No. no. Okay. Um, during this session, we've heard so many suggestions, and that's what I originally wanted to talk about, but um, ideas of important political struggles, indivisible meetings with congressional reps, local campaigns to raise the minimum wage, elections um, about, uh, I'm sorry, uh, infrastructure, massive infrastructure campaigns, the education uh, struggle, move to impeachment, voter suppression. Um, so, you know, there's so many um, areas of struggle. But what I wanted to talk about instead of that is how do we win the whole working class to unity? To an injury to one is an injury to all. And you might <clears throat> start here by saying, why do we need to win the whole, the whole working class? Well, um, why don't we just try to go for a big majority? Um, well, because the working class exercises its role as a class, as the whole class, not as a portion of the class, but also the urgent task that we have right in front of us today of preventing fascism, we have to know that fascism does not need a majority to come to power, but it needs a mass base. It, it needs a mass base, and so we can't be satisfied with the majority. We have to stand in the way of preventing that mass base. There aren't nearly enough finance capitalists and real estate billionaires to make a mass base. This, so this would be an issue for us even if Hillary Clinton had won the election. Um, the Trump vote has been sliced and diced. And, uh, you know, I'm not denigrating. I think all those are important. Urban, income, gender, race, age, racially isolated, blah, blah. You know, all those things uh, that I don't have time to get into. But I want to focus on one part of it. I mentioned there's 30 million small businesses in the United States. This is not a separate class like this from the working class because many workers move back and forth into that class. Many work, well-paid workers have their own little business or aspire to that. They, they may come and go. They have a foot in both camps. And um, the class lines don't correspond to income levels. You can have workers who are much more highly <coughs> compensated than business people. And so a lot of these communities interrelate. And the workers are exposed to an influence by the small business ideologies, the anti-government, and so on. Trump voters may call themselves working class. But we have to challenge, or Trump may call his supporters working class, but we have to challenge a narrow, harmful vision of the working class. Um, and I think we have to fight for a different narrative of the working class. So ironically, capitalist Trump narrative sees white, these white workers as pathetic. They're uneducated, they're prejudiced, they're motivated only on their own economic concerns. And I mean, he doesn't say this, but if you think about what he's saying, they're losers, you know. Um, uh, 
themselves and their children on drugs, whatever. They're the ones who didn't make it. They're the ones who, you know, they didn't fulfill the, the dreams that are, they're supposed to be under capitalism. Our narrative needs to address the anger and the resentment and the feeling of left behind that capitalism causes all workers to feel, not just point where all workers feel left behind and powerless and insecure that they don't have control over their conditions. And I think we need to change it into a narrative that engenders the pride and self-respect. And the pride includes the multiracial nature of our class. And therefore, it allows all workers, black, brown, and white, to see themselves not as losers but as winners because they can solve their problems together and they can they are powerful. So I think unity is our is key to our strategy of winning the working class. <coughs> We've heard a ton here of concepts of unity, a ton of terms. And it can be confusing. United Front, Popular Front, Labor Led People's Coalition, Left Center Unity, Unity Against the Ultra Right, Multi Class Alliance, anymore? Okay. So um, they're all useful concepts, but we as scientists need to sharpen our thinking. Should we be talking about left center unity of the working class? Wrong. Okay, Bruce, sorry. I, I know I just said the term to a lot of people. Well, I don't mean the term, but the concept. Because um, we should be talking about unity of the entire class, the entire class. And um, for one thing, we can't be okay with a significant section of the working class being under the leadership of the right wing and this, thus a base for fascism. So I think where we can talk about certain leaders of the working class or, or whatever as being the, uh, on the right and we want to have left center unity even in the labor movement, to talk about the class as a whole, I don't think we want, this is you know, up for grabs here, but I think it's a problem to talk about left center unity within our class because we don't want unity of part of our class against the other part of the class. Um, so uh, have another term, unity against the ultra right. I also find that flawed because leaving out any reference to the class character of the ultra right leads us in that same dangerous direction where we're unifying all these forces against these other forces, the ultra right that includes a portion of our class. So I think we have to talk about unity against the you know, corporate ultra-right or that section of the you know, corporate class that is ultra-right, not just an, a classless ultra-right. Again, this is up for grabs here. Um, so let's go back to the uh, definition of fascism. Who remembers the official definition? I didn't write it down. The file, go ahead. Yeah, the, the the historic communist definition was laid out uh, by uh, George Dimitrov. You have to speak up, I, Carl. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, the classic <coughs> communist definition of fascism was laid out uh, by George Dimitrov, the great Bulgarian communist, uh, at a commentary in Congress, I think in 1936. And if I can remember it just about verbatim, fascism is the open terrorist dictatorship of the most chauvinistic, imperialistic, uh, reactionary, there might be another adjective to it, there, sections of monopoly capital. So the key things here, open terrorist dictatorship. Uh, okay, I'm all, cutting you off because you're taking okay. my time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I call it a second. So, but the key thing is of monopoly capital. And I think today we can think of finance capital. And I think we need that term in there to say what we're, you know, what we're uniting against. Um, <clears throat> so we should not be for, um, no, I said that already. Okay. Um, and I have one other issue. <laughs> and that's the term multi-class alliance. I think we need to adjust it. The concept is a valuable one. But we're not calling for the alliance of the working class with the capitalist class. Um, it's of great tactical importance to us to be open and to fight for an alliance of the working class with a section of the capitalist class, whichever section might be you know, ready to join with us in taking on the ultra-right part of the capitalist class. But I 
troubled that the term multi-class alliance doesn't make clear that it's a tactic to take advantage of divisions in the capitalist class and not um, a, strate a strategy of, um, you know, uh, allying the, the two classes. Um, so, uh, and it doesn't make clear that there's different sections that we might ally with in different times. So maybe the term a temporary alliance with a section of the capitalist class, or maybe cross-class alliance, something more clear. Um, <clears throat> it also kind of feeds into this idea of the working class as being kind of narrow. So if you're talking about multi-class alliances, people start thinking, oh, alliance of teachers, alliance of uh, tech workers, alliance of organized labor, you know, instead of thinking of the whole working class. Um, Finally, um, I think our catchphrase, labor-led people's coalition, is also problematic. And the reason why is that we need to win uh, progress in socialism. What we need is a, pe a people's coalition led not by labor, not by the unions, but by the whole working class. Of course, labor will organized labor will play a huge role in that, but it, we can't, again, we have to fight for the role of the whole working class. Um, and labor-led implies that labor is the whole class. It makes the class much smaller. This, words matter. They shape our thinking. And that's why I'm bringing this up. And these are uh, not, you know, I'm not, I'd be happy to be corrected. It's not, I'm not making a definitive statements here. So uh, <laughs> if we agree uh, we need a strategy to win the whole working class, what is that newest strategic approach, given the fundamental changes that we talked about two minutes. Okay, I'm good. All right. Um, so here's our resources. <clears throat> we have our communication tools. We've got the People's World. We've got social media. We've got the CPUSA website. We have followers coast to coast. People are writing to Rosanna every day. Uh, we're part of local networks in many places. Um, we have comrades, young comrades as well as old ones, the young ones with very valuable experience and wisdom. Uh, we have our brand. <laughs> we have prestige. We have a certain degree of authenticity. Um, we have contacts with leaders and activists and unions and all kinds of other organizations. We are lucky to have a fairly united labor movement with fairly <laughs> progressive leadership, the most, um, I think, in our history. Uh, and a leadership that's not under control of overtly, you know, pro-capitalist uh, leaders. Our party and our movement have a culture of camaraderie, of solidarity between people of different uh, races and genders and uh, ages. Um, we have a leadership of black leaders, Latino leaders who are revered in our movement and outside of our movement. And um, we have that history that we're so proud of um, that they're making the buttons for you know, about the fight against racism. We're part of an international community. That our international ties are so important to us. Um, and we have material resources that our community, our family, has had handed down to us, both um, uh, financial resources, but things like the collection of works at the Tamman Library. And we have a family of allied organizations like International Publishers that does so much to contribute, the People Before Profit Education Fund and so on. But most of all, we have our working class science. We have a long range vision. Um, so on the one hand, the new nature of the working class has inadvertently caused us not to appreciate the new strength of the working class, the fact that we are really the 99%. But on the other hand, I think our policy of industrial concentration as it was is not, you know, up to date. Um, working class has changed, so has the organization of production. There's no huge factories with thousands of workers. We can't just focus on organized labor because it's less than 10% of the workforce. We have to give great attention to industrial workers and the organized sector. There's still a lot of leverage there, but it's not enough. So where do we put our lever? You know, where are we going to put these resources? I know you're all waiting for the answer here. <laughs> Is it workers in a particular sector of the workforce? Is it tech workers? 
because they can, they're like a choke point, they could stop production, or transportation or communication workers, because they're in a very powerful place. Is it low wage workers, a group of workers that could strengthen immensely the labor movement if they were organized, um, perhaps in non-traditional or different methods of unions, the way industrial unions changed how people were organized? Or maybe is it as a work group, is it communities across a certain issue, like those affected by the energy revolution, bringing together green jobs, people in coal industry, election, electrical production, as well as environmental native, do we come up with some campaign across that? Is it around a struggle like the infrastructure? Or do we look for a demographic group like young workers? Or maybe a certain geographic area, the red states or counties? So I don't have an answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm not satisfied. None of these fits to me, none of them. And um, so I think what I, and I don't think we could solve this here, but I think it's something for us to ponder. We need a strategy to unite and move the whole class. We can't just address everybody en masse. We have to focus on something, and it has to be the thing that will move the whole thing. So um, I, I try to uh, use here some of my ideas as a worker and synthesize some, some things. So I hope that um, this will be a, a useful um, uh, start to this discussion. Thank you.